morning, church family. Good morning, those that are here in the sanctuary and those that are following us online. I want to tell you that God is a dreamer and God enjoys turning people's dream into reality. Two years ago, God made one of my childhood dreams come true. The geography teacher of uh, elementary school in my childhood was a guy that was an avid reader, and one of his favorites was Jules Verne. Anybody heard about this writer? That's a French novelist, adventure novelist. And uh, this teacher liked him so much that every single class he would speak about him, trying to convince us to read his books. One of his books is Around the World in 80 Days. Okay, that rings a bell. And the other book, very famous, Five Weeks in a Balloon. Now, I remember myself as a child thinking about this, daydreaming, and uh, imagining myself going around the world in a balloon. Two years ago, before COVID hit, Share Him, which is an, a, a mission agency that I collaborate with, sent me to the Philippines. And from the Philippines, I was going to fly to Europe, meet my family, and then fly back to the US. When I got the tickets, I was stunned. Because according to my tickets, I was going to fly from Miami to Atlanta, from Atlanta across the United States to the Philippines. And uh, I had a layover in Tokyo, then to Manila, then to Iloilo. From Iloilo, I flew to Kuala Lumpur. From there to Frankfurt, Germany, from there, where I met my wife and spent a few days, we flew back to Romania, from Romania to Turkey, and then back to the United States. Now, if you know geography, you can look up the map. That is literally around the world. Isn't God amazing? So we got back to the United States, and the next week, I'm taking my kids, our kids, to the park. And at the entrance of some parks down in South Florida, there are libraries. I have not seen those things here yet. At the entrance, there is a little house, and there you find books. You can leave books there if you don't need them, or you can take books from there. And because I love books. Whenever I go to such a place, I have to stop, check it out, see what's there. So I'm opening the door, and the first book that uh, jumps out to me is this book, The World is Flat, A Brief History of the 21st Century. And I'm like, what? The world is flat? I've just been around the world. And then I'm, I'm looking at the author, Thomas Friedman. I knew Thomas Friedman was a pretty famous journalist of the New York Times. So I'm telling myself, man, this has to be some sort of a metaphor. What is it about? So I'm starting reading. And pretty soon I start understanding his point. This is what he's saying. Because of IT, because of information and technology, all the world today is connected. Which means that nearly 
everyone from everywhere can access nearly anything from anywhere. That's how the world has become flat. And then uh, he explains the big words like outsourcing, insourcing, offshoring, supply chain, and some other elements that somehow made this world to become flat. And he points out that there are opportunities that come with this, but at the same time, there are challenges. One of the examples he gives is uh, CPAs in America. Do we have CPAs here? Okay. This is what he says. CPAs in America now do not only compete with CPAs on the American market. They compete with CPAs from all around the world. Have you known that part of the legwork for quite some quantity of uh, tax return documents are not even done, is not even done in America. They are done somewhere else, maybe in India. Yeah, that's the world we live in. So, yeah, based on this, you indeed are competing with workforce from all around the world. But when I read that, and the book is very interestingly uh, laying out all these realities, I thought, hey, if the world has become flat, that's a great opportunity for the gospel. Because if the light is to shine, then a world that is flat can receive the light. Because if the world is flat, light will travel immediately. The reason why we now have uh, daylight here and some parts of the world, of our world, have night is because of the way physics work. So I said, okay, praise God. It seems that behind the scene, he himself is flattening the world so that the light of the world, Jesus Christ, can shine. But let me ask you something. Hasn't the light always been shining all around the world? Come with me to John chapter 1, same place where we find this chiastic structure. You have uh, the upward and the downward slope, and we are looking at verses 9 to 11 on one side, and 14 on the other side. This is what it says. That, meaning Jesus Christ, was the true light which gives light to whom? To every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And then verse 14 on the other side. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that your spirit will enlighten our hearts and minds so we will understand how Jesus Christ, the light of the world, shines. In his name, amen. There are two very interesting concepts in this passage. One is the impartation of light. The other one is the incarnation of light. Impartation and incarnation. And the question is, if impartation is real, and according to verse 9, it is real. This is what verse 9 says. That was the true light which gives light to how many people? To every man coming into the world. If the impartation of light 
is real, then why was incarnation necessary? Did you get the, the, the question? If this one is real, light has been imparted to everybody, then why incarnation? Well, the next verse, verse 10, kind of answers the question, because he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And here we have two very interesting philosophical ideas. One is ontology, and one is epistemology. Do we have any philosophy major here? Okay. Ontology has to do with existence. Epistemology has to do with knowledge. Don't check out yet, because I'm going to explain this. There are some people, because these two concepts have created two extremes in Christianity. There are some people that believe that because the need of the Savior is an ontological need, meaning you only need the light or Jesus Christ to exist. That means that everybody will be saved. If the need of the Savior is only ontological, merely ontological, it means that everybody in the end will be saved. God will somehow find a way for everybody to be saved. This is called universalism. Universalism. Meaning that everybody, everybody will be saved. And these people find Bible verses that they emphasize that kind of go in that direction. For instance, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Who wants how many people? All people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Or you have uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to how many? To all people. Or John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, how much did he love the world? That he gave his only begotten son. For what? So that whosoever believes in him will not perish. So this is the concept of universalism. At the other end, the other extreme, is that you do not only need the Savior as an ontological need, you need the Savior as an epistemological need, meaning everybody that is to be saved, every sinner that needs a Savior, needs actually to know Jesus Christ as a historic figure, he needs or she needs to know his acts, his works on this earth. So practically, if you and I do not go and preach the gospel to those people, they have no chance, they are lost if they die before or without knowing Jesus Christ as a historic figure. This is called restrictivism. And they also have Bible verses that they rely on. For instance, you have Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else but who? Jesus Christ. Or John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except how? Through me. Or you can find the first John chapter 5, verse 10, uh, 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Whew, pretty difficult. Universalism and restrictivism. I have a question. First to the universalist. Listen. If you are saying the need of a Savior is ontological, you only need the existence of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God wants to save everybody, right? Does he want to save everybody? Of course. My question is, will he save everybody? Will he save everybody? No. How about those that do not want to be saved? Will he force them to be saved? Doesn't the Bible teach that there will be some that will be destroyed? The wicked? Let me ask a question to... The restrictivists, all right, you are telling me 
Everybody has to know, in order to be saved, every sinner has to know Jesus Christ as a historic figure. And if you don't get to know Jesus Christ as a historic figure and whatever he did on this earth, before you die, you are lost, you have no chance. My question is, is there anybody on this planet earth that had no chance? Has there ever been anybody on this planet earth that had no chance? to know Jesus Christ. Well, look at what verse 9 says. What does it say? He was the true light which came, which gives light to how many? To every man coming into the world. So then can you say there is anybody that had no light? No. Because Jesus Christ was real, the light existed before incarnation as well. Yes, Jesus Christ, we know it from the Old Testament, Jesus Christ was the Yahweh God that even appeared to people. It's called theophany. What does that mean? It means that, for instance, Abraham got a visit from God, from Jesus Christ, in person, in a human body, I don't know how that happened. That's a, a sort of a theophany. Or think about Jacob. Jacob even wrestled with him. And you have Moses. About Moses, he declares that with Moses, my servant, I don't speak like with any other people. I speak to him how? Face to face. Now, if God did this, if Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnation Jesus Christ, did this with these people, how do we know he did not do these kind of things with other people? He could have used all kind of means to reach people everywhere. And yes, according to the Bible, he has always given light to every single human being. It's hard to believe it. But every single human being coming in this world. Even today. Today there are people that have no idea about Jesus Christ as an incarnate God the way we know him from the Bible. Does that mean if they die before somebody, a missionary can go to them and preach the gospel to them, they are lost, they have no chance? Only if they willingly resist the light that God imparts with them wherever they are in their specific circumstances. And for you to see that I'm not speaking from outside of the Bible, you have this verse, you have some other verses as well. But it's interesting that even Ellen G. White confirms the same interpretation in uh, Desire of Ages, uh, Desire of Ages, page 239, this is what she says. Very interesting. Please follow carefully. Our standing before God depends not upon the amount of light, watch this, we have received, but upon the use we make of what we have. Thus, even the hidden who chooses the right as far as they can distinguish it, that's a very interesting concept, are in a more favorable condition than are those who have had great light, but, but what? And profess to serve God, but who disregarded the light and by their daily life contradict their profession. That's a very interesting statement. Just think about it. There is resistant ignorance and there is non-resistant ignorance. Let me illustrate this. A Bedouin sleeps in his tent. And uh, in the middle of the night, he wakes up. Out of a sudden, he feels hungry. Man, he cannot sleep. And he knows in a pot next to his bed, there, is, there are some dated dates. I don't know if you can imagine how what dated dates look like. They are dates, but they are dated. So he reaches out to find a pot, but he can't. So, so he says, okay, let me, let me uh, make some light. So he kindles a candle. 
And uh, at the light of the candle, he finds a spot and he starts eating. But as he eats, he feels something is weird. It, it feels like something is moving in the pot. Man, what is this? So he, he takes the pot, brings it to the light of the candle, and lo and behold, the dated dates made worms. So what should he do? Well, he has a very simple solution. <sighs> he blew off the candle, blew out the candle, and he continued eating. Very simple. See what it means to be ignorantly resistant. You have the light, but you don't care about the light. You just go on with your life. And this is interesting, this concept of life. You know, there has been a time, th there was a time before the internet. I know this is shocking for our teenagers, because they gather today around the internet. Okay? But there, there was a time before the internet. Uh, let, let, me, let me give you even, even more. Some, some of you still remember there was a time before the TV. Uh, yeah, because before the internet was the TV and you gathered around the TV. But before the TV was something else to gather around what? The radio. Uh, no, nobody will believe you, you gathered around the radio, no. <laughs> no. But even before the radio there was something to gather around what? Uh, uh, uh. It's, it's fire. Yeah, a table might be there, but it's fire. It's the light. So here's my point. You would expect, if the light is in the world, that everybody will gather around the light, right? Well, that's not what happens. Because the Bible says some love the light and come to the light, whereas some others hate the light and go away from the light. And it's interesting, but in spite of the theophanies, in spite of the Old Testament as a light, in spite of Israel as a people of God that brought light, in spite of the sanctuary that was basking in light and the temple later on, in spite of missionaries sent into the world like Jonah, yeah, there was light here and there, and yet... The Bible says they did not know the light. This is what Ellen G. White says in uh, Desire of Ages 638. Among the hidden are those who worship God ignorantly. Those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality. Yet they will not perish. Why? Because God imparts light. He has his ways. Nevertheless, at one point in history, because of some divine calculations, some arguments that we know of and some that we don't have any idea of, God said, I'm going to go one step deeper and I'm going to bring the light into the world in a different way. And then verse 11, this is what it says. Look at this. Verse 11. He came before it says that he was. Right? Now he came, he came to his own. Who are his own? If you look into the context, you will see that in that context, his own are all the created world. But then, if you look closer, you will see that his own may be a reference to his people, the people of Israel. It's interesting how God prepared the coming of the light, the, the incarnation. Because you had impartation, now you also have incarnation. God had prepared that. He put that people the people of Israel, right in the middle of the world at that time. The, the Fertile Crescent, if you know your, your map, f the, the place where three great continents are joined, Africa, Europe, and Asia, that's where God placed the light when, when incarnation happened. 
So that from there, from the intersection of those commercial roads, people can take the light in all directions. And one more interesting aspect. He came like in the middle of the world, at the hub of the world, so that nobody can claim exclusivity. Nobody can say, hey, he's only ours. He came to a place where the population was mixed. It was a mixed multitude. So that white people not, can, cannot say, he came for us only. So that black people cannot say, no, he came from us only. So that yellow cannot say, he came only for us. He came for everybody, right there at the hub. And what happened? And his own did not receive him. Please notice the tension. The tension between light and darkness. The fight between light and darkness. Huh. Has, has anybody here ever been camping? Camping, like, like for real, okay? Because there's, there's a sort of camping uh, done these days that has nothing to do with camping, okay? Camping in the sense you take your tent, okay? You take your little tent, okay? You pitch it on the campground and you live in it. I used to do that when I was a child, you know, with all the hardship of living out in the country. And we had to work throughout the summer. We had to work. Not, not just help, work. But we had that week of camp. Actually, 10 days, two weekends and in between. But one summer, because we had so much work, our parents would not allow us to go for the full week. They said, hey, we have to do the work. So it's only one weekend. So we thought, okay, my older brother and, and myself, let's ask our friends from the church to take our tent to the camp and pitch it. So when we come in the weekend, we have a place to stay. Right? So it was... Thursday afternoon, late afternoon, when I arrived, it was only me. My older brother couldn't come eventually. So after walking a long distance, I'm, I'm there. And I go straight to one of the guys that was in the door at the entrance of his tent. And uh, I greet him, he greets me, and I'm asking, okay, so where's my tent? And he said, oh, you know, we kind of forgot about it. We, we pitched our tents here in this circle, you know, and then there was no, there was no place here, you know. So we had to pitch it somewhere. It's, it's, it's there, you know, in that corner there. Oh, man, you know, a 14-year-old, I didn't feel good. I mean, really? This is, this is how you how you receive me this is how you accept me i'm left out i'm let down what is this he came to his own and his own looked around and said huh i don't think there's a there's a an appropriate place for you to pitch your tent here because look Look what verse 14 says. And the word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. The Greek actually says, pitched his tent among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, that's incarnation. Incarnation has two aspects here. One is Jesus Christ the light 
is an incarnation of God. God incarnate, meaning the God that revealed himself so many times in the Old Testament, now came in a human body to bring to us and show to us the God that was never seen by anybody, according to verse 18. So he incarnates God. God is now in human body. But at the same time, he's an embodiment of the Old Testament. He's the incarnation of the Old Testament. I told you before, I've told you that in the Old Testament, you have concepts like Torah, the law, Chokmah, wisdom, Davar, the word, Emet. Anybody knows what Emet means? Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a young man called Emet in our church. It's truth. Yeah, Emet. Truth. And there is or, which means light. Now, all these concepts refer both to the Old Testament as a writing in its entirety and to the Messiah, the incarnate God that is to come. When Jesus came into our life, into our world. He incarnated the Old Testament. Not like the philosophers. You know, many philosophers in this world, they have ideas. And they share their ideas. And people accept their ideas. Some people even commit suicide because of the ideas of a philosopher. But at the end of the day, few philosophers really believed what they said. Jesus came to embody, to incarnate what he had said in the Old Testament. This is very important when it comes to reading the Bible, interpreting the Bible, especially the Old Testament part of the Bible. Why? Because I have the impression we have gotten to a point in our, in our endeavor you know, to, to, to make the Bible palatable where we kind of teach Jesus how he should understand the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? When, when C.S. Lewis lost his wife, he wrote a very interesting book. I recommend it. A Grief Observed. Anybody read the book, A Grief Observed? Okay. He did not sign the book. He printed the book under a pseudonym, N. W. Clerk. So now some of his friends found the book and they thought, man, this book would be helpful for, uh, for Lewis, man. <laughs> so they bought, he, he received several copies as gifts. And some would even sit down with him to explain to him the concepts in the book. When, in fact, he himself wrote the book. Did you get my point? Yeah, that's, that's what we do with Jesus. Kind of sit him down. L -l -l -let, me, let me tell you how this is. You know? Yeah, in those times, yes. In those, real, yeah, but now, and I'm going to tell you how. Pretty risky endeavor. Now watch this. The... Light came into this world. The, the, the Logos was incarnate. He became human, pitched his tent among us. The tent, please notice what is going on here. The tent is an illustration of the human body. That's what the tent is. His human body, his human body had the light in it. So if you cracked the entrance, so to speak, of the tent, what would you see in there? Huh? The light. Because the light came, right? But do you need to crack it? If you turn all the lights off and uh, you put, put on the blinders, and it's pitch dark here. And you have a light burning inside there. Do you need to crack the entrance so you can see there's light in there? 
Do you? No. And that's why John says, hey, we saw. Although his, his light, because this is, this is beyond our comprehension, although light was, was shaded, if you want, it, it, was, it was hidden, if you want, it was sheltered. The light was dwelling. But let me ask you something. Can you hide the light? Can you shelter really the light? Can the light dwell in a human body? Well, very limited ways. That's why Ellen G. White sometimes says that the divine fleshed through the human. Have you read that? Yeah, because how can a human body comprehend and, and comprise the light? It's too much. And John says it beautifully. We saw his glory. We saw the glory. Okay, what was the glory like? When, when, when that tent was shining, and, and this tent is like having the sanctuary tent in the middle of the tents of Israel. Can you see the picture? Three segments here, three here. Three here and three here. Four times three, 12 tribes. It's shining. You see two components. What are the two components? What is it? Grace and truth. Now that is remarkable. Grace and truth. No, no brother, no pastor. I just love the truth. I don't care. I'm going to tell the truth, you know? Eh. The truth. All I want is truth. Amen. For the glory of God. No brother. Mm -mm. Grace and truth. But pastor, all I want to hear about is grace. You know, I don't care about the truth. Grace. Grace. Only grace. That's what I want. For God's glory. Amen. Uh-uh. No. Grace and truth. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, an assessment of our church family of the needs, of the most uh, predominant and uh, uh, prominent needs of, of our church family. And there are two concepts that are coming back to me again and again from my elders. One is, Pastor, this flock needs to be shepherded. Shepherding. And the other one is sound teaching. I would translate that in this language. I would say grace and truth. And that's, I believe with all my heart, that's why I am here. To preach grace and truth. Please notice, in that same order... I know it's much more convenient to turn it around and say truth and then grace. Ah, no, 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 no. no, 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 the other way around. First grace and then truth. Because that's what the church needs. And yes, that's what the Laguna Hills and Valleys need. That's what the flat world needs. Grace and truth. In that exact order. You know, two years ago, when I was doing my around the world trip, without planning on it, of course, but God knew it, I got to Germany, and by God's grace, I had the chance to preach for the very first time in my life in German. Pretty nice church, maybe the size of this one or even bigger. So I was hoping that they will record the sermon and it will be a point of reference for me. You know how much online presence they had? Zero. Zilch. Nothing. And I said, how can, how can a church be in, in one of the most prosperous economies of the world and obviously of Europe, and, and the, the light is not shining? How, how come? I don't know how. I had a conversation with 
my good friend that is at one of the conferences, a leader of the conference, and he kind of was, uh, I don't know, we, we don't really emphasize that. Hey, the world is flat. Do you, do, do you get it? The world is flat, which means that you can be anywhere in the world and you can shine because Jesus Christ is within you. Hello? You can shine so that everybody will see you from anywhere. And you are telling me, oh, we didn't think about it. I want to I affirm your AV department for the, for the efforts they are making to become a digital evangelism department. And please, please get used to a new concept. We don't have a AV was in the good old times when you needed sound in the sanctuary and you needed something to be projected. Now we are doing evangelism, global evangelism. Why? Because the, the earth is flat. The light, God, you, 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 you may only see the virus. You say, ah, the virus and what this virus did to us. No, no, no. God is behind the scenes. God is leveling the field. God is stretching the world out. God is creating a flat world so the light can shine. Brothers and sisters, I wouldn't be here if I had not believed this. And I want to tell you something. Some of you may, may, may be looking at me and, and expecting me to, to bring the truth. Because this church is lacking the truth. I'm here bringing the truth. But if you will ever see me bringing only the truth, please stop me and talk to me. Some other may be waiting for a pastor to start eventually bringing the, the grace of God because this church is lacking the grace of God. This church is legalistic, is, is, is this or that. I'm here to bring the grace of God. And if you ever see me only bringing the grace of God, please stop me and talk to me. And watch this. I'm here to bring grace and truth. If you ever notice I mix them up and have them backwards, truth and then grace, please come and talk to me. The light came into the world, got incarnated, and everybody could see his glory grace and truth. The light is incarnated now through the presence of Jesus Christ in your heart, in you. You are the light. I am the light, says Jesus. You are the light. Go shine. Grace and truth. Amen? Amen.